most of the undergraduate courses at the university. There was someone from Washington looking for me. There was a great shortage of scientific talent in 1943. They invited me to go there, but they would not say what they were working on. They would not say where the place was. Uh, we were supposed to send all of our belongings to something called Post Office Box 1663 Santa Fe, New Mexico. That was the only hint. And uh, indeed, when we sent things by railroad, it was also to Post Office Box 1663, which was fictitious. <laughs> so that's the story. We were very isolated. We were in the middle of nowhere. The number of scientists was initially, when I was first there, was probably smaller than 200, but divided into many separate groups pursuing different work in different directions entirely. And many of the problems were ridiculously difficult, in fact, impossible <laughs> to solve. The work was carried out all of the technical work within what was called the technical area, which had a separate fence around it, and one needed uh, special identification to get into it. Then there was the town surrounding that, where the town had maybe altogether a thousand people who were mostly young families. The People, as I've mentioned, who were so young on the project had been married for a few years. Uh, they were producing babies much more productively than anything else that was happening at the laboratory. <laughs> the army was producing <laughs> more and more babies there. And uh, there was a military police area connected to the laboratory, and this was all within a large fence. But the fences were almost beside the point there because the country was crossed by enormous canyons which were impassable. <laughs> you could only get up there by one road. So there was this sense of isolation. On the other hand, the climate was beautiful. The hiking to walk out in the country on the, on the weekends was, was marvelous. Uh, and it was an extraordinary place for young people. Now, how did one get food? Well, the army had a supply system. It, it, it produced a, a grocery store there, and uh, one saw movies. <laughs> they, uh, in the gymnasium, the large wooden gymnasium they constructed, uh, they would show movies three nights a week, and the admission cost 10 cents. salaries were low uh, in those pre-inflationary times. I, am, I must say my salary, I think initially the first year amounted to $25 a week. And I had, we had to pay for food. I think I paid as much as $14 a week for food, but it was excellent. As civilians, I wasn't in the army. Uh, as civilians, we had to pay rent to uh, some sort of agency. I don't know what it was, $20 a month, maybe. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Well, you, it was a military post. You could not buy any beer other than 3.2 beer. It was at a low percentage of alcohol. That didn't mean that the military police never got drunk. <laughs> The parties did not have any significant quantity of alcohol if they involved many people, but they usually involved a punch bowl. But it was a place in which everything was provided for you, everything was done for you. You had nothing to do but get up in the morning, go in, do your work in the technical area, and come back. And what you did then, if you had a family, I, I suppose, was, was prescribed for you, but if we didn't have families, the uh, bachelors who lived in the dorms. We uh, most likely went to the movies or uh, listened to a poor signal on the radio coming all the way from Albuquerque. <laughs> there wasn't much out and we did a great deal of reading. I'd have to say I probably never did that much reading. <laughs> there was a theory division directed by Hans Beta. Uh, I was in a group run by Robert Serber, his name was, and their problem was neutron diffusion, uh, how you find the critical mass uh, of the uranium-235 <clears throat> and, and plutonium. What are the critical masses and how much does the critical mass depend upon the surrounding matter, uh, which we called the tamper? Uh, that if you put scattering material around this sphere uh, of fissionable material, it decreased the, uh, the critical mass. And uh, alternatively, uh, if you uh, had a larger mass than critical, it had a certain exponential multiplication rate. And I calculated many of those. It was uh, not a very original position to be in. These were well-defined mathematical problems, but I, I could deal with them by reading the papers. <laughs> the atmosphere was good. We were informed on all of the problems. Uh, the laboratory tried to keep information from going out, uh, and there were many efforts at that. But the exchange of ideas within the laboratory was extraordinary. And it's, it's interesting because when General Groves was put in charge of the project and when it began, his first thought was that nobody should know anything about what anyone else was doing. And uh, it was Oppenheimer and the people around him uh, the scientists, the chief scientists, who had a terrible time persuading him that that way of proceeding would never work, that one really depended on having the ideas contributed by everyone who understood the problems. I know that the bombs that we make in Los Alamos cannot be exploded by such countermeasures. Oppenheimer had an excellent understanding of science. He had never written very much. And I would have to tell you, the papers he had wrote, you cannot understand. Uh, but he, uh, his understanding was excellent and his ability to verbalize his understanding was extraordinary. Everyone agreed on that. Uh, there were not any other people really at the, at the laboratory who would have the same ability to sound and act like a leader. And that was extraordinary because there was no sign of that earlier in Oppenheimer. That was a kind of insight of General Groves, uh, which was very strange, remarkable, and he was eventually very embarrassed by it. He came from a wealthy 
very sophisticated family in New York City. He went to private schools. He probably never had many friends as a child. There was a period in which they thought he had tuberculosis and should go to the West to breathe the cleaner air. And so his father bought a cabin in the mountains uh, a little east of Santa Fe in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. And he went there and rode horseback, he and his brother, during the summers. That's why he knew that region so well and loved it. The language locally was entirely Spanish. In that part of New Mexico, you would never hear English. And he had learned Sanskrit in college. He developed uh, what he thought was a very deep interest in, in the Hindu scriptures by reading Sanskrit. And of course, uh, he would quote us. Oftentimes when he spoke, he would <laughs> uh, produce quotations from the Lord Vishnu. And uh, uh, of course, you could only respect that. How could you? <laughs> <laughs> he was widely read. He read, he read fluently in three languages as well. And uh, in that sense, he was much more of a literary figure than virtually any of us at Los Alamos. The experimenters, uh, for the most part, rather, <laughs> you would call them American primitives, if not cavemen. Uh, <laughs> they were people who did practical things in practical ways and who did not have these romantic intellectual interests. That was not only a source of amusement, but even of respect. Well, that's uh, the first time I've seen it, but if you don't mind, I wish you'd hold that under it, because after all, there's uh, about $50 million. But General Groves was a not very well-informed military man who had zero understanding of the science and who thought that most of the physicists were madmen, he realized, Groves realized, that he needed someone who could talk to him, persuade him of what was necessary, and at the same time command the respect of all of these strange scientists. And I would have to say there were extraordinary people, many of them at Los Alamos, but Oppenheimer was about the only person who could fill that role. Groves and Oppenheimer worked together in a sense, in a way that I could never quite understand because Groves is not the kind of person Oppenheimer would have chosen as a friend or collaborator. He felt he had a responsibility to keep informing Groves and to secure the right actions from Groves, and he did. Uh, I don't believe there is anyone else there who could have done that. What went on between them was probably fairly intense and in any case very private. They were never public about it. But I do have the feeling that they represented a kind of joint personality which was very effective at Los Alamos. Beta was, in many ways, the, the most extraordinary person on the project because he had a kind of theoretical versatility that was amazing. He could estimate anything to two or three significant figures with simple calculations. He uh, had a wonderful imagination as a theorist. He understood theoretical physics 
better than anyone else in the place. There were other people who were very gifted this way, but none of them at all comparable. That this revolution, the revolution of the electronic brain, was practically initiated by Johnny von Neumann. Edward Teller was a chief rival. When I first arrived at the project, I saw Teller's name written in chalk next to an empty office. Teller, on learning that he would not be the leader of the theory division, uh, went off in an angry state and disappeared for a month or two. Then he came back and was encouraged by Oppenheimer to establish a group of his own, in fact, a division of his own, which was not under Beta. And that division had as its only assignment trying to find a way of initiating the thermonuclear reaction in deuterium. And uh, he broke away completely from the rest of the laboratory. He was an arrogant man in his own right, and he ran this small group, which had, I would say, very little success, virtually no success, uh, by the time I left the project at the end of 1945. And there's a very important thing that the people, who, a lot of people who study physics who come from mathematics don't appreciate. The physics is not mathematics, and mathematics is not physics. One helps the other. Feynman had been as a student at MIT, he had won mathematics competitions. He was very bright and very fast. But uh, he then became a graduate student at Princeton, and more and more Feynman developed a kind of persona, we say, a way of presenting himself to the world as someone who is brilliant, and different, and full of funny stories and he became a kind of great entertainer, among other things. So any time you had a lecture by Feynman, you knew that there would be a, a great deal of fun, that he would make fun of people in the audience, that he would make jokes, that he would do everything in a way that was so original you had the feeling you had never seen anything like this before. And he made a, a very strong impression. He loved stories in which all of the people he was dealing with were one more stupid than another, and who would tell these stories at lunch, and it entertained everybody at the table. I have to tell you, I ate lunch with him many, many days, but after I heard some of these stories as they were embellished the third and fourth time, I found it really very boring. <laughs> he, uh, but those stories kept improving, and they always had some germ of truth in them. Later, he told many of those stories to the son of the physicist, Ralph Layton, who was also a writer. And that gave rise to these books, Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman, and all of the others. They were all stories that he told and embellished over the years. Uh, as they appeared in Layton's book, they were still much more polished than the ones I had heard. <laughs> when there were parties, as there often were in the dormitories at Los Alamos, uh, and there were not very many women there, but those that were there would gather around him and he would perform in a corner telling stories while the music was playing. <laughs> Many of the experiments had to do with the use of explosives in order to detonate the bomb. And so every once in a while, the place would shake when there was an experiment. They thought they had put Los Alamos far enough away from any city that it would not be evident what was happening. But it, for some geological reason, when these experiments were performed on the mesas near Los Alamos, there would be a good deal of shaking in Santa Fe, <laughs> which was 35 miles away. 
And uh, they uh, were very curious in, in Santa Fe about what was happening at Los Alamos. And reporters who came through would report this. It happened, I remember one time, a reporter from a Middle Western newspaper came through and he did a little investigative reporting. He uh, learned about the shaking of Santa Fe. He discovered the names of many of the military people who were there and who was the commander of the base and so on. He talked to the people who ran the uh, clothes washing laundries in Santa Fe and learned many of the names of the scientists and printed them. But he could not put it all together. He uh, collected stories of people who had driven trucks up to the front gate and then had to stop. So all of this made a two-page spread in a newspaper in, it may have been Toledo, Ohio, or, or Akron, I cannot remember the town, but it was potentially very embarrassing. And there were quite a few such breaches of security. This particular article asked at the end, what are they working on up there? And someone made the suggestion, I think it is windshield wipers for submarines. <laughs> They were very careful to avoid words like the bomb. The bomb was a word you never heard in the place. But what was it we were working on? Well, the best suggestion was the gadget. The gadget was the synonym for the nuclear bomb. It was just meant to convey nothing to the people who were not cleared. There was another element of uh, deception involved uh, in the terminology that we used. Uh, there was a famous detective novel uh, by Dashiell Hammett called The Thin Man. And there was an awareness also that when the spherical implosion bomb was created, that would not be very thin. It was going to have to be a, a fat looking bomb. <laughs> so the one was referred to as the thin man and the other as the fat man. That terminology got shifted a little. Uh, you didn't hear the term thin man very much after 1946. Somebody had called it the little boy as opposed to the thin man because it was, uh, it was not a very large bomb. It could easily be carried by the B-29s that existed at the time. The uh, implosion bomb was the biggest thing that could be carried by that sort of plane, and it may have even have required some modification to accommodate it. The Hiroshima bomb was this slenderer, long object, and it was put together with a literal gun which shot this cylinder of uranium-235 into the accommodating piece. Later bomb, the Nagasaki bomb, was indeed the implosion bomb, very much the same bomb that was tested in the Trinity test. The Hiroshima bomb was considered to be a foregone conclusion. They thought likely enough that that would work. I must say there was no experience with nuclear explosions, but uh, they were persuaded that they could have a nuclear explosion and were already shipping parts of the Hiroshima bomb into to Tinian Island. The time scale was such that they were not going to use this thing within some week so they could send it by boat. They sent, I think they sent them on a battleship.
There was a pool, a betting pool, in Oppenheimer's office. One could put down, I can't remember whether it was $2 or $5, uh, and in a notebook, uh, you put your prediction for what it would be. The predictions went everywhere, from zero up to uh, about 100,000, 100 kilotons. And the man who won the pool, who, if I remember correctly, was not regularly at Los Alamos, I think it was I.I. I. Robbie, it was a very clever fellow. He had gone through the book and looked for the largest interval with no bets. To people who don't have the fundamental feeling appreciation, who don't have a feeling for the glory of the human spirit. As a theorist, I was not part of the experimental arrangement. Three others of us drive to the, a place where there was a mountaintop near Albuquerque, where you could see off in the distance, perhaps 70 or 80 miles. It was a little further than we thought, in fact, the explosion, and the immediate flash was hidden behind a hill. So we did not see the direct flash, but of course the entire sky lit up from beneath. There were clouds, and uh, it was as if the sun had risen in the south. Five, four, three, two, one. was evidently just what we had been talking about for years, two years. And uh, it uh, certainly frightened us all. There was a period of absolute quiet in the one month following that. That was in the middle of July, July 15th, I think, of 1945. È la materia prima dell'era atomica. Si ritiene che i depositi di uranio ora conosciuti nel mondo ci potranno fornire energia sufficiente per parecchie migliaia di anni. Fermi was a very ingenious guy who believed in doing simple, clever, simple things. And indeed, when he, the moment he saw the flash, he began dropping little pieces of paper, knowing that when the blast came by, it would displace these pieces of, of paper, and he could guess by the displacement of the blast what the efficiency had been. And he made a pretty good guess. I can't remember what it was. There was not a protest at Los Alamos we were on a military base, and we were there, you might say, as guests, but also as employees of the military establishment. And we felt that we had to keep quiet. Uh, there was a statement that we made, uh, and it did have some influence later, but the people who immediately had influence were the scientists in Chicago. Chicago did not have was not a military base. These people felt much more free. If General Groves had had his way, the people at Chicago would never know what they were working on. But several of the most important people in Chicago knew very well uh, that they had furnished the means of constructing this weapon. And these people from Chicago went to Washington immediately and they were suddenly very popular. The Congress wanted to hear from all of these people. We at Los Alamos were really not only under the thumb of the military, but we had the, the admonition from Oppenheimer to keep quiet. 
Oppenheimer believed at that stage that if you just keep quiet, there are wise people in Washington who will make all the correct decisions. Uh, the recommendation of most of our scientists would have been to make a demonstration of some sort. And it became clear from the kinds of words that came back that the military did not want to do that at all. That they wanted, they had a new weapon, they wanted to demonstrate it, they wanted to use it. If the war were to end without casualties, they felt that would be a wrong end to the war and it would influence what happened later. Uh, they wanted a complete and absolute victory. And uh, if it meant casualties, well, they were saving American casualties because the alternative was that America would invade Japan. The only other way of ending the war and was, was an invasion, and indeed an invasion was being prepared, which would have come some months later and would have required invading one island after another. So they made that decision. And uh, I do not know how the vote went in these committees, but that was eventually revealed as, as what had happened. No joy whatever about the use of, uh, of the bomb, or at least no one I knew. What it was was the fact that we were suddenly told we could communicate freely with people on the outside. That morning when, when it came out there, I was able to find the little office that took telegrams and, and write out about a five-word telegram to my folks who had not in fact heard the story by the time they got telegram because telegrams were delivered by telephone. They didn't, <laughs> they didn't have people going around on bicycles <laughs> as, uh, as the image was. So they, uh, they got the story early and had no idea what it meant because they had not yet read the paper or even heard the story on the radio. They were even a little frightened of what I said and something like, that's me, mom. that we were suddenly known to the world. It was known what, that we had done it. On August 6th, there was no news about the ultimate success, the end of the war. That waited for several days. And of course, we had not been told ahead, it is going to be used on August 6th. That was the deepest of secrets. Uh, and likewise, for the use of the Nagasaki bomb three days later. And in fact, if anybody had asked us, we would have urged that they not use the second one, that it was completely pointless. The only point it had was that the military were in possession of a weapon they wanted to show the world. You must also realize that raids as destructive as that, and in some ways more so, were routine and they were taking place daily. The most unique thing about this particular raid was that it involved three airplanes, only one of which was active. In the other raids, you had 
hundreds up to a thousand planes blanketing Japanese cities with firebombs. Dealing in these terms with casualties running to tens of thousands was, I'm afraid, not, not unusual. So that was already true in the European war much earlier. And it's a very interesting question and one I, on which I can deliver very little wisdom. Had we succeeded in making the bomb work a few months earlier, would it have been used in Europe and how? I think you can debate that endlessly because it's quite a complicated question. So the period at the end of 1945 was a very strange one because the scientists from Chicago and even a few from Oak Ridge went to Washington and began explaining to the Congress what nuclear weapons were. The scientists at Los Alamos were very quiet because we were living on a military base and because Oppenheimer felt that if you just keep quiet, everything will be fine. Uh, he had great respect for the man who was the Secretary of War, Stimson. And we believed Oppenheimer, but eventually there was so much discussion of where we should go with weapons production that uh, we could not remain silent anymore. And we produced a statement for uh, President Truman. It was never made public directly, but it became the basis for Harry Truman's statement that the United States would prefer international control of atomic energy and nuclear weapons. We were influential in that sense. And then once that statement was made, several of the scientists from Los Alamos went to Washington and began making the case directly. What happened then was two years of, of struggle over the creation of an atomic energy authority in, in America, many suggestions for international control, and none of that went very well, even though there were many wonderful proposals. But the, the Russians managed always <laughs> to stand somehow in the way. They wanted first to develop the weapon themselves, then they might begin talking. post-war years, uh, Oppenheimer was a unique figure in America. Uh, people of all different ranks and sorts tried to be in his presence. Uh, he was being interviewed. Uh, he was, as we say, being lionized all the time. You saw his picture everywhere. So he was an American hero. but. Uh, he became influential. Oppenheimer would give his opinions, and his opinions were extremely persuasive. 
to the scientists. Uh, at the same time, there were other influences in America, uh, principally distrustful of Russia, and with the feeling that one will never reach any agreement with them, that one must simply arm oneself to the teeth. Teller, of course, had that view from the very first and was always trying to persuade people in Washington that they must put still more uh, effort into making the thermonuclear weapon, the hydrogen bomb, work. At a point at which the Russians finally produced the bomb. And that put a scare into everyone. Truman had no choice but to decide to go ahead full speed with uh, making the hydrogen bomb work. The man who uh, probably played the most pivotal role uh, was a mathematician, a Polish mathematician, Stanislaus Ulam. Ulam had been a very abstract mathematician in the period in which I knew him best, when he was first at Los Alamos. He developed some practical ability to do calculations, real calculations with, with uh, uh, ignition problems and, and diffusion problems later. And he seems to have been more responsible than Teller, finally, for the weapon as it was developed in 1951, 52, when they actually performed those tests in the Pacific. And Teller, meanwhile, was working against Oppenheimer for years, because Oppenheimer felt, this is in the period 47 through 49, that we did not need the thermonuclear reaction. Not only did we not know how to build it, but we did not even need it. To tell her that was nonsense. You had to build not only the hydrogen bomb, but if you could build a still bigger one, he would. Uh, he would build the ultimate weapon. And the American primitives, the, the less sophisticated Americans, began to shift toward Teller. Uh, and there was really a confrontation. The man who became uh, director of atomic energy was a man uh, named Louis Strauss. He was called an admiral, but he was never in the Navy. And he felt that their duty was to, was to build the super bomb immediately and uh, he began to feel that Oppenheimer was wanting to go slowly on that. The truth is Oppenheimer was rather apathetic. That became a, a, a conflict. Oppenheimer had an arrogant way about him, and he was dismissive often of people who would uh, disagree with him uh, unless they had excellent arguments. Louis Strauss felt insulted by Oppenheimer and began slowly to try to decrease Oppenheimer's influence. And eventually, the only way they could do it was to undermine his loyalty. Well, Oppenheimer had made enough mistakes as a, as a romantic intellectual, had talked to the wrong people, had, had uh, associations that they could uh, decide were, were suspect and disloyal, uh, that they really went after Oppenheimer. And by 1954, was it, held this great loyalty trial, which has no precedent in American legal history. It was a procedure in which they invented their own legal rules as they went ahead. And they even were tapping his telephone and tapping all of his conversations with his lawyers. So it was, in a sense, foolish of Oppenheimer to allow this even to happen. Oppenheimer would have lost his loyalty certification and would, would not have worked on the projects, but within some time, he would probably have recovered. But what they held was this great dramatic process in which they had to decide that he was disloyal. And it was nonsense.
I didn't like the idea of secret work. I, I didn't find it very attractive anymore. On the other hand, I found that my contemporaries were really competing with one another to get into it. It was their way of gaining power and influence. And that wasn't the kind of power or influence I wanted. <laughs> I felt I've been there <laughs> and I don't want to do that sort of thing. <laughs> You had all of these characters who were bent on making the hydrogen bomb, which always seemed to me completely pointless, and it is still pointless. I, I think the hydrogen bomb has no purpose whatever uh, beyond being still worse. But it, it, it's, that's not a weapon which is suited to anything that you really want to destroy. Uh, it, I think it was a foolish thing from the very beginning. Uh, it would have been better if it had never been developed. I was not part of the project, and after 1945, I wanted no further connection with this stuff. Mm -hmm. 